Welcome to the MAM Journals, or more accurately, a MAM Muse. I'm here today at the XL Exhibition Centre in London, and I'm at the Silverstone Auctions. Uh, compound is probably the best way to describe it. Uh, there's 150 bikes here, which is uh, pretty pretty good going to get bikes to central London um, in that sort of scale and the logistical challenges. Um, I couldn't possibly talk you through 150 bikes uh, if I'd lose the will, even if you didn't. Uh, so. What I am going to do is try and walk you through a few bikes that have caught my eye. I want to have a look at, um, there's three Triumph Hurricanes here, so I want to have a look at those and talk you through a bit of the history of that. Um, that I then want to um, have a look at, as I tend to, I like looking at the um, Kawasaki's, the Z1's, and there's, there's two here, there's a, there's a Z1 and there's actually a, an A4. So we want to look at that and we'll just talk through some of the issues on those. And I then want to actually look at a bike that um, preceded that and certainly in, in road terms when we were riding them in our youth um, was actually a well-regarded bike but you don't often see it at auctions and that is the Suzuki GS 1000 and there's a really nice one here so we'll we'll talk through that that will lead me on nicely to there's a stunning Kawasaki Z1000 J2 which I actually saw at the Stafford show and it won best in class for the 1980s absolutely immaculate and now it's up for sale so well, I'll talk you through it and we'll see what it actually goes for after that I'd, I'd like to have a, a look at a, a bike which I'm not sure I really understand to be honest and that's the Bruff Superior not one of the original ones from back in the day um, but one of the um, reimaginations, rec recreations, or just copies, depending on how you look at it, uh, of, of that model. And we'll talk through what it is, what it offers today, and uh, what I think of it. And you'll obviously have a chance to see what you think. Then on a slightly lighter note, we want, I'm going to have a look at a couple of bikes which I think are interesting, or certainly made me laugh. Uh, there's a 1977 XT500 here, which, is, which are always popular. They've got a bit of a cult following. And more unusually, there's a 109 mile XT250 1980 bike, which we can have a look around and um, reminisce over. I hope you enjoy the video. And as we do go around, I'll be just showing you some bikes which caught my eye as we walk from bike to bike. Well, this is one of the bikes I thought it might be interesting to have a look at. As I say, there's three of these Hurricanes. I remember when I first saw one of these, probably about 20 years ago, at um, the Bike Museum, and I wandered in, and it was a bike that struck me as being very different from all of the other bikes that I saw in the museum. And because, frankly, it doesn't look like a Triumph. So, there's, as you'd expect, there's an interesting story with these. The bike wasn't actually designed by Triumph, it was designed by a guy called Craig Vetter. And you might know that name through um, Vetter Fairings. Um, he was an American and he, he went to the design school and the head of BSA actually um, commissioned him to see if they could do something with the, with the BSA Rocket 3 in sort of 68, 69, which um, well, we're trying, BSA were trying to import into America, but it, it was just a bit too bland for them. And the brief was, well, can you Americanize it? And this uh, was the outcome. And they put the designs up to BSA. BSA was struggling at the time, and uh, they weren't entirely focused on the, on the project. They, from memory, they lost, in 1971, they lost 8.5 million, uh, 3 million of which was actually on the bike division. So uh, they were in their death throes, to be honest and uh, nothing happened with the bike with the one after Craig had delivered it until such time as NVT really sort of emerged from the ashes through various stages. Um, that NVT is being Norton Villiers Triumph and they uh, made 1,200 of these in an attempt to resurrect sales. Sadly, it was also a time when there was significant um, industrial unrest at Meriden and uh, really the fight was all over bar the shouting. Shame, nice bike, good performance, and very attractive the way that Craig Vetter had put it together. Interestingly, he didn't like those exhausts when he uh, first put it on, uh, but he, he grew to like them later. It was just the easiest way of getting the, 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 the triple out. 
and give him some sort of stylistic effect, keeping it nice and narrow. It's a very striking bike. They think the bike will sell for, um, as this one's an original, they're estimating somewhere between 25 and 30,000 pounds. Copies, replicas, recreations, they're obviously a lot less. Um, all right, this is, um, this is a replica. Um, it's uh, based on the BSA Rocket 3, which is the bike that was imported to America or exported to America, and um, they were really doing, trying to make it more attractive to the American market. For a bit of fun, he's actually called it BSA. Uh, I don't think it ever, well, I know, they were never sold as BSAs, um, although the prototype was clearly um, done in that way. This bike, ironically, is actually in, in period because it's a 1968 rocket, um, but that was before they actually did the Hurricanes. So it's, you know, it's, the timing is right for the bike, but not right for what he's done to the bike to create this replica. Quite nicely done. Um, I said it, as it, it is the proper engine in it. It's got the conical hubs at the front there, which on the front wheel, which is always nice to see. And I think it's, you know, it's a bike you could have a lot of fun on. Um, completely different price range, of course, from the original one that was absolutely right. And this, and this one is estimated to go somewhere between 12 and 14,000 pounds, which is funny enough, it's probably 10 to 12,000 pounds is what you'd pay for a very nice Rocket 3, um, which is the bike that frankly didn't really sell despite the fact it was a nice engine and performed well. There is one more of these, we should just go and have a look at that. Um, this is the third of the, uh, the three bikes that they've got here today. Um, based on the, the Hurricane. It's, as you can, no, the more experienced of you will tell by look, looking at it, that's actually got a Triumph engine in it. It's not got the BSA um, Rocket 3 in. It's, it's nicely done. It's a, it's a good bit of fun. I'm not sure about the rack, but I think that might make it practical. But it is a runner. I mean, you, this is a bike you can actually sort of probably do a little bit of fettling. Um, just to, so to get it running again, and you, it's, they think it's going to sell for something between nine and ten thousand pounds. So I think that'll be a lot of fun for somebody who actually wants to ride a bike on a Sunday like, like this, as opposed to um, perhaps the, the original one where it may well end up being collected as opposed to ridden. So nicely done, and the least valuable of the three. Oh, this is the um, Z900, it came out in 1976 and uh, it's called the A4. This, this particular bike is uh, an import, it's an American market bike. Uh, how do I know that? Um, it's got no strap on the seat, it's got a single disc. When they came to the A4s, by the time they got to Europe, um, this particular model, they were twin discs for the European market and single discs with an option of twin for the American market and it's got some reflectors on there. And the other thing that just sort of confirms it to me is it's got a short mudguard at the back here as opposed to the long European mudguards. Um, the bike's in nice condition. It's got um, 22,000 on, on the clock. They're estimating this bike as between 10 and 12,000, which sounds about right. They've, I think there's been a, some softening of the prices on the, on the, the Z900s, um, but this, a nice one is still worth good money. Right, well, this is the um, the nicest Z in in the uh, well, certainly Z900 in the in the auction. This is a 1973 Z1. I've always liked this colour combination. This has been tastefully restored, and uh, sometimes they're overdone. They, you know, to to my mind, they you know you can over polish the crankcases. You can make it look sort of dip, completely different from how it actually left the factory. Um, this is an American specification bike. Again, no um, strap on the seat, and it's got the short rear mudguard again, sure indicators. This one was actually fitted with the optional front discs, so I twin discs rather than the single.
bike's only done 124 miles since it was actually restored. So, you know, it should be um, ready to either go into somebody's garage or collection. Wow, that is loud. <laughs> but but um, we'll see how it, how it goes through. This is estimated as 20 to 25,000. And on a good day with the right people here, yeah, it could get that. We'll see. Some of you might remember, um, I was talking about Craig Vetter. That story sort of, I didn't know Craig Vetter had designed the Hurricane, I, but I do know him, it, of him and I, do, and I do know his name, both through the fairings and through something else. We've just looked at um, a couple of Z900s, uh, uh, and a, an A4, an original Z1, and those bikes were replaced in 77 and 78 by the A1 and A2 Kawasaki. Now, super bikes were a big thing in those days and the AMA had picked up on it and were very keen to promote superbike racing. They'd actually um, run a series in 1976 when they first opened the first superbike series and it was won by a guy called Reg Pridmore who um, was actually a Brit uh, from London. Uh, ironically, I'm, I'm in London now and, and, and he sold everything up. I think he was... 24 or something like that loaded what he could in the, in, into his bags and, and off he went to California because he fancied some Californian sun and he was actually a capable rider and he won the first championship on of all bikes um, a twin um, the BMW which was um, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the, the team that sponsored him but it was the importers for the BMW Butler and Smith I think was the actual uh, the company that, that did it um, he won it three years running. In 1977, he, he won on a um, Kawasaki Z1000, which, well, was highly tuned. I mean, they were something like 140 brake horsepower. Um, so, um, bearing in mind, a Z1000 came factory standard with 83. It certainly made it go, um, but they couldn't do much about the handling. They were pretty evil things. And um, he won the race. That was... That team was run, because in those days, manufacturers weren't running factory teams. It was really either importers throwing a bit of money in, maybe some dealers, or just a, spot, a keen supporter sponsoring the, the bikes. And that was, so he won the second championship on the Kawasaki um, with race crafters. And this is where Craig Vetter comes in, because the next year, Vetter's actually sponsored the um, Z1000 but won the championship again. He was making good money then by, some of you might recall, a, a fairing range called Windjammers, which were universal fairings that fitted on car, but uh, fitted on bikes. He was a smart fellow though. I um, mean, he, he recognized the manufacturer was gonna do it. So not only did he sponsor the winning team um, in terms of the AMH Superbike Championship in 1978, he also sold the Vetter Corporation at top of the market when he was really uh, doing well and retired to California. Smart guy, knowing how, how to set up a business is one thing, knowing when to get out of it is another skill altogether. And he clearly mastered it. So that's how I knew Craig better. Now, the reason why I'm stood in front of a GS1000 talking about all that is because the Kawasaki was notoriously bad handling. And although they could get lots of power out of it, they did struggle. So, um, Pops Josh and Murray, uh, was actually formed his own team. Although he'd been fitting the cams and the pistons, Yoshi parts were fitted in the Kawasaki's that were won. Yoshi Mura is probably more famous for tuning of the Suzuki's. And they actually um, gave him the money to set up his own team. And it was the Yoshi Mura, uh, race team. He c took with him, for his experience at Kawasaki, a guy called Wes Cooley, who was... Um, um, sort of knee high to a grasshopper sort of guy, completely crazy uh, uh, and a very talented and brave rider. They took him and they actually won the championships on bikes based on this bike, the GS1000. They won it in 1979 and 1980. Now, it's unusual to see the GS actually in an auction. I see lots of Z900s, I see the occasional Z1000s, but I hardly ever see these. And this is a particularly nice one. And they were 
good not only were they winning on the track they were also perceived as good bikes on the road and they did handle a little bit sweeter um, as a road going bike it's slightly more powerful than the z1000 at the time but and it had twin discs and cast wheels In 1979, they brought out a slightly upgraded version of this, which had, from memory, it had an audible indicator and mm, gas stroke oil adjustable rear suspension. This is up for 10 to 12 thousand pounds, which is a lot of money for a GS, and certainly uh, when you compare it against some of the sort of classic Z900s, which you can get about that sort of price, but. I think it may well reach the money because it is unusual and it's in one very original condition and two, um, been low mileage, low ownership. So I think it, we'll, we'll find out later, but it's a nice bike. And, and if, you, if you're one of those guys who wants a sort of a Z900, a Z1000, a GS1000 and all those sort of sequence of bikes, um, then and you haven't got one in your collection, this would be a nice one to have. Nice, original, clean, tidy bike. Well, keeping the sort of sequence of AMA Championship winners rolling, um, after, Suzuki had two years of glory with their GS, but um, the one that actually surpassed it was, was bikes that looked a bit like this. This is um, uh, 1982 Kawasaki Z1000, and some of you may recall that the Eddie uh, Lawson replicas um, were we're really based on the shape. Eddie Lawson won the championship 81 and 82 and they actually took his bike from the last race of the championship, took it back to Japan and made copies of it. They actually made 30 copies and, and imported them back and uh, they were called the S1s. If one of those come, come up, this would be great to see what they go through. Tragically, the standard road bikes were um, if you'll excuse the expression, verging on sailproof, because as I touched on earlier, really, new technology was coming. It was very apparent, um, certainly by 83, um, AMA had said that the, uh, the racing was not going to be allowing 1,000 1, mile, 1,000 uh, cc bikes, and they were going to go to 750. Honda were working on a liquid cooled bike and launched the V45 Interceptor and actually Kawasaki launched um, the 750, which actually Wayne Rainey won uh, on it, but it was an air-cooled bike, and I uh, was quite surprised to do it. While well, they soon got the, the V45 Interceptor sorted, and they then dominated the championships. But these bikes, as I say, were really treading water in showrooms. They did a lot of copies or replicas. They did the S1s, which were extremely valuable. They then did a, a hundred, hundreds of um, their first replica versions, which again very valuable bikes then, but they didn't help much. And dealers laugh about it in America and say they, you know, they stuck their replica, which they got from Kawasaki, left it in the crate, and it was there for months. And they sort of gave it away to anybody who expressed any interest, which was quite interesting, really, as I say, because nowadays they are the ones to go for if you can get a whole old one. Later on, they, uh, they, they, they had another go at doing replicas. They were actually selling them in '83, by which point. Um, Eddie Lawson was certainly riding for Yamaha on the on the Works MotoGP um, bike, but uh, they had that legacy halo effect. As really they were just to say treading water, waiting for the GPZ 900, the liquid cooled bike, to hit the shores. This bike I saw at the Staffordshire Show. It won Best 80s Bike. Stunningly done. Really nice. If you wanted one of these in your collection, normally I say that they're not particularly valuable. They think this one might be worth 10 to 12, and they might be right because I don't think I've seen a nicer Z1000 um, of this type uh, in 10 years. So really nicely done, and it should be interesting to see if there's uh, a couple of people who want to own it. Uh, this this is a bike. If I'm honest, I don't really get. 
Um, but just because I don't get it doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about it. And I perhaps should explain why I don't get it. I first saw one of these, I think it was 2016 at the Sa Privy Saloon or Saloon Privy, whichever they are. Um, oh, I'm dyslexic, so both of them work for me. Um, but uh, at Blenheim, and I think I had a chat with Henry Cole, so I think he had some early involvement with these. I don't think he's still got it now, but um, these are very limited edition reimaginations, recreations, homages, whatever word you want to use, to the Bruff Superior, which are extremely valuable bikes. A Bruff Superior actually sold for Bonhams, I think. I saw one go through at £330,000. Give you an idea. Now, these, when I was speaking to Henry Cole, he was saying they were £60,000. Um, and I, whilst I can see the quality of the engineering, for me, it's neither, it's neither fish nor fowl. Is it actually a retrospective? Is it a fateful copy? Or is it some sort of homage? So I didn't quite see um, who was going to buy it because Bruff Superiors were called Bruff Superiors. Actually, there was two Bruffs. There was William Bruff, who start, founded the company and made ordinary Bruffs. And then there was um, the son, George, who was a, an exuberant sort of character. Very good on a bike, actually. did very well on international six-day trials. Um, and really helped build a reputation of his own brand built in Nottingham, um, which he wanted to call the Bruff Superiors. And the idea of being Bruff Superiors was it was better than any other bike. Now, if it's trying to do relive the image, it's not better than any other bike. It's, you know, there's, there's lots of bikes you can spend £60,000 on, which will be um, a lot more advanced than this. They'll have great engineering and they'll have phenomenal performance, which at the time the Bruff Superior did. There wasn't much that could keep up with the Bruff. So I, I don't quite get them. This, and, and if, I don't think I'm alone, and the reason why I don't think I'm alone, I've seen a few of them go through and none of them have gone through them for more money than they were paid for in the first place. And I think this will probably be £30,000. And at £30,000, you could almost see that you can have a lot of fun with something that is modern and reliable, um, and will probably start, and um, you, could, you could do a few hundred miles on um, in the summer and enjoy yourself. So, to me, that seems a more sensible sort of proposition and view, but we'll, we'll see what it goes through at. And, I think with these sort of bikes, you never know what happens to values, because most most of the, the Ferraris and the various other things that go for ridiculous amounts of money now, at one point in their life, they were worth significantly less than they were paid for new in the showrooms. It's only as time progresses and they go off and build sort of value, and, and people suddenly realise what a great car it was, how few there are, and they start increasing value. This might be one of those sort of bikes, um, but certainly. It's in its fallow period at the moment and might just be a bike that somebody who can afford £30,000 on a run around um, enjoys and has the pleasure of owning. I've always been quite fond of these Yamaha um, Enduro XT500s. I'm not sure you'd actually want to do an Enduro one, having done a few in my youth. Um, but the, the bikes aren't actually really capable of serious off road. Uh, in, in this form that they were sold. They are capable of, of doing off-road when they've been heavily modified. Indeed, uh, an XT500 um, won the Paris to Dakar, so they were proper bits of kit in their way and they were obviously played off the back of that to produce a road going, stroke trail going bike that could be done. If you do try and do one of these off-road, um, you will find that you will snap the front yokes and have the um, front forks talking, pointing in various different directions. Uh, please don't embarrass me by asking me how I know. Um, I like, like the bikes, they're not particularly powerful, um, and then really they were a logical progression from other earlier bikes in the 60s when um, that, I mean, the Yamaha did the, the DT, the, the dirt track bike and models, and they did them from 50cc to, I think, 400, but feel free to correct me if I've got it wrong. Um, and then, they, as I say, the Honda really started with the XL250 and got the volumes going. And then Yamaha came in with this bike, the 500, which is quite a big bike in terms of off-roading, four-stroke, single, 
very popular cult sort of followings. They think this is going to be between seven and eight thousand pounds, and it wouldn't surprise me if it gets that. Um, I should have bought one when there were three, um, but we're all we've all got 2020 vision in hindsight, haven't we? This is the XT250, the smaller brother, and indeed later it came out a couple of years later. This is a 1980 bike. Um, they were never sort of used seriously in, in competition, but the 250 class um, was quite popular. It's a great farm bike, you know, outside trails and, and but nothing too vigorous. They, they began putting these gold wheels on them in the 80s and, and these covers over the, the spindly front forks. Um, this bike, amazing, one owner from you, UK bike, 109 miles. Um, it'd be interesting. Normally they don't go for much money, to be honest. They're not as attractive as the, as the 500, but they're asking, I think, somewhere between four and five for this, um, or that's their expectation. And it might be, because it is, I guess, a collector's bike with such low mileage on one owner. Um, but if you're going to ride something actually off-road, you'd probably be better off buying a Sorrow. Um, a much more modern bag, 2016-17, for a, maybe three or four grand, uh, and have fun with that. This really is sort of now in collectors only territory, unless it goes for uh, significantly less. I'm going to do my best to keep my hand down, uh, because it is a bike I wouldn't mind in my garage, but I'm not sure I'd want it owe me £5,000. Uh, one of the, uh, the first bikes, or series of bikes that we looked at, were these Hurricanes. And, um, I sort of thought that they actually might be softening a bit, and I, and I think they are. I think it's a generational thing. I think the people who want one of those and are very serious collectors have probably already got one. Um, so it's hard to see quite who's going to be the next generation of buyers, um, unless the people think that they are going to be in more younger owners' collections. So. They were looking to get 25 to 30,000 pounds for this bike. And although it's a very nice one, nice and original, UK bike, slightly unusual, um, a good collector's bike, it didn't actually get, get the bid in. It, the bid was 19,000 pounds, which if you, if you add the commission on, that's probably 21,400, something like that. And it's sometimes difficult to tell with the auctioneers quite what they're doing, but I get the sense that it wasn't actually sold I'll confirm it later and we'll edit it into the, um, the video if it, if once I get a bit of clarification. But for now at the show, I thought, no, that channel tells me prices are softening because that's a nice bike. Right, uh, we looked at the, the first of the Hurricanes that um, we looked at at the, at the beginning, the, the, and indeed the most original. This is the, the Triumph engine one and the one that we originally thought was going to be the least value and indeed it proved out to be that and it didn't it sold but it didn't quite hit um ex the auctions expectations so this sold for eight thousand pounds plus if you rough add on roughly 12 and a half percent then that will give you an idea so let's call it i don't know nine thousand pounds so it's going to uh, it's going to owe you sensible money for riding around and it's probably not going to be if you bought a brand new bike for £9,000, you're going to lose more money on it than you are on this. And you, you, it's, it's not so special that you can't actually ride it. So if you're into those sort of things, I think somebody's bought themselves a nice bike at that. They'll have a bit of fun. I wouldn't mind having a go on one of those, actually. This is the third and final one of the Hurricanes. Uh, and so the owner had some fun with it, um, labelling up as a BSA because in fairness to him, it is a BSA. <laughs> He's just dressed it up like a hurricane. And um, it did sell. It, it, they got £10,000 for it, which is what we thought initially, i.e. it was going to be the midway price of the bike. And um, again, I, I think it's a, a bike somebody can enjoy riding and not losing any money on it or losing very little money on it. I think it will hold that value for quite some time. And hopefully somebody has a lot of fun with it. Great to see. The Kawasaki Z900, or the KZ, the, one of the bikes that we looked at earlier, um, actually attracted a bit of interest, which was good to see. And it is a nice example, and, and sold, I think, relatively well. Um, it was bid, 9,500 was the bid, but of course you have to add the commission on top of that to get the price that the payer 
the purchaser paid. So I, I think when you've added all the commissions up, it'll probably be somewhere in the region of £10,700. So I think that's quite a nice price for a nice example of an A4. As I thought, actually, this bike did really well. It, that's such rare to see because if anybody saw the Jays, and if they, if they weren't replicas in the first place to make them sell, then everybody's converted them to green Eddie Lawson lookalikes. Um, and you just don't see, one, the J2, which this one is, and two, this color, this color combination. So the bike actually went for just under £17,000, and that is the most that I've ever seen um, a model of this type sell but well done to the um to, to, to the, the guy who restored it put the work in it's nice to see that um, it's generated interest and they've had fun doing it i spoke to him uh, very nice guy put it together in lockdown and he, he bought it a few years prior to that and had it in bits in the back of his garage and thought well if i'm going to be locked in he ran out of domestic chores to do and he said well i'll get on and do it and he's done it he won he had the fun of winning the staffordshire show and um, the best bike of the 80s, and he's had a fantastic re result here in the auctions. That's a, a nice story and a nice bike. This is uh, another bike that we were looking at earlier, and um, I certainly don't want to appear unenthusiastic about it, which would be unkind and unnecessary, so, because some people do like them. Uh, again, it was one of those bikes that didn't really attract the, the buying interest that I'm sure the existing owner would have hoped it, the, the bidding got up to £27,000 which if he paid over 60 for it and did 470 odd miles on it you'd probably be a bit disappointed that you'd lost half of your money um, on something that is you know quite after all a quite a rare bike so I'm not sure whether 27 plus commission actually bought it uh, but I'll find out once the sale is closed and I get a chance to speak to them at the end of the day. But um, that gives you an indication of the sort of value that they're putting on these rare bikes. And in fairness to them, although I'm not sure it's my sort of thing, I do think that you could, if you spent £20,000 on a new BMW or a new um, Ducati, the depreciation on that would be significantly greater than it was likely to be on this bike if it owes you that sort of money. Um, the original owners at 60,000 have obviously got some pain to, to carry for a few years yet, but you never know, it might come back and it might be an interesting bike to ride. Yeah. Uh, as you know from my comments earlier, I, I, I do enjoy these XTs. They, uh, it's interesting, when they came out in the late sort of 70s, they were actually quite small compared to the bikes that very quickly um, replace them as time went on you know the 600 versions of these are probably another few inches taller so they were quite good fun to actually ride for the people like me the vertically challenged and um, this was uh, they didn't have anything like electric starts or things like that. it's got a little decompression if anybody sort of remembers them and I actually never had one of these I had a slightly older bike uh, um, or younger bike I came later I had an XL 600 and that didn't have a kick uh, didn't have an electric start that just had the decompression labor and just just to give it a whack and these um, the 600 was actually more difficult to start than this um, which with, with slightly less compression on the 500 than there was on the 600 and um, there is a knack to it but it's not as awesome or, or as difficult as some other singles can be and uh, give you a good crack on the machine. But it went well. Uh, people were interested in it as I thought they would be. <laughs> I, was, I was half tempted to stick my arm up, but I thought, no, you'll, you'll only end up taking a nice bike and throwing it into a hedge somewhere and ruining it. I have with every other off-road bike that I've got, so I can't imagine this one would ever be any different. It went for 6,200 plus commission, so that's going to be just over the 7,000 pounds. So, yeah, they're valuable little bikes and a lot of fun. I can see why they've got a cult following. Um, the bike next to it, of course, is the one that um, Stuart at the other, other end of the camera has fallen passionately in love with. I'm lost for words, really. I don't quite know what I'll do. There's a, there's, I can find 
room in my garage for lots of different bikes. Uh, that will not be one of them. <laughs> but anyway, somebody loved it. It went for two and a half thousand pounds plus commission. All good fun. Road legal and MOT'd. We actually didn't film the last few bikes that we'd highlighted earlier as they were towards the end of the day and the team were beginning to clear up after what had been for them a long and frankly pretty busy day. The Z1, which was a particularly nice example, sold for £20,475, a price that I think demonstrates just how popular really nice examples of this bike are. $50,000 anomalies are probably just that. There was one that went for sale in one of the American auctions for that extraordinary sum. This 20 odd thousand pounds feels like the real world price of a nice one. The GS1000, which I thought was a nice bike, actually sold towards the upper end of what they normally go for at 6750 but didn't attract the collector's interest required to reach the hope for 10 to 12,000 pounds. I think someone would have had to have fun with the bike and uh, that sort of money. Hopefully they can get a few miles on it as well. The XT250 absolutely roared away, achieving a quite remarkable 10,125 pounds. That is definitely collector's territory in terms of price, and there was a couple of keen buyers fighting it out to own it. In fairness to them, how many one owner, 109 mile bikes are actually out there? I am not expecting to see it green laning anytime soon. Other bikes that caught my eye, and indeed included the bike that commanded the highest price of the auction, were some very nice Ducatis. I'm never sure what the collective noun for Ducatis is. Uh, I suspect it's an invoice. The Senna's 1 and 2 went for 38,250 and 22,500 respectively. But the biggest price went for this stunning, unregistered and immaculate 888. 47,000 250 pounds. A remarkable price for a remarkable bike. We enjoyed our day at the XL. MCN were running their um, motorcycle show and with it there was a new drag strip formula where they ran in the centre of the hall. It certainly created excitement and noise. It's not perfect for recording but funnily enough, I suspect they weren't actually targeting YouTubers for the show. We had hoped to film the show itself as well, but um, condensed into one hall, the stands were a little bit smaller than perhaps usual. And as a result, I felt they were too congested to film properly. Hopefully those that attended had a good day. Uh, lots of people put a lot of effort into putting the show on, and I hope that people enjoyed it. So... A £17,000 question. Uh, what bike did I enjoy the most at the auction? Well, for me, the bike of the auction was the Z1000J2. It was a great bike and a great story, and I was delighted to have uh, seen that, been there to see it um, go through the auction. I do hope that you've enjoyed this video, and if you did, perhaps you'd be kind enough to press like or maybe even consider subscribing for the channel. Our next video will be covering the Kawasaki Z900 RS SE, and um, hopefully some of you will be kind enough to tune in to watch that. In the meanwhile, and as always, ride safe, stay well.